particular release. Coming to chickpea, the crop I work, although most of you may be aware what is chickpea and how it is, but still I saw several students are there, so I thought to just give them. If you see chickpea is one of the excellent source of high quality protein. High quality means there are several, if you see several crops which are high protein, but chickpea protein is high quality because it's a good digestibility, which determines the bioavailability. Presence of nutrition in the seed is one thing, but presence of that nutrition for a body is another thing. So if his biology is good, that is very good quality protein. And it has the large amount of a fixed large amount of atmosphere nitrogen. So chickpea's second most important green legume cultivated globally, which over 70 producing over 17 million tons in the last year. If you see chickpea global production has been constantly increasing in the last five decades. And there are two types of chickpeas, desi and kabuli. One of the major thing, despite being the largest producer, India's largest importer as well. Why? Because chickpea is one of the major food source for the, what we say, the vegetarian diet, and it's a very good nutrition source. And despite sustainable growth, chickpea production last decade in India, there's a huge gap in supply and demand due to limited supply. So despite, as I mentioned, it's still it's the largest importer, producer, Chick India is also the largest importer. So we need to develop and adopt improved varieties with higher yield and nutrition to reduce this yield gap so that India can become the self-sufficient and contribute to the export also. But what are the factors affecting chickpea productivity? If you see, chickpea has a potential to address nutrition security, to address the micronutrient deficiency, but several limitations like stress tolerance, drought, heat, sanity among abiotic, and biotic, if you see escalator blight, season build, and cover is the major thing. And then there are other things. But how we can start doing this? We can start doing the data analysis and we can illustrate the linkage mapping and frequencies. We can identify candidate genes, the super haplotype. Then we can develop the diagnostic markers and start using those markers in the marker selection, macro thing, make allergen screening, and using genomic selection. We can accelerate the chickpea improvement effort. This is something which we have been doing it and how we started it. At Equiset, you might have seen that program where I work is now I'm a research program genetic gains. So our major focus is to enhance the rate of genetic gains for the work crops. I work on chickpeas, so my agenda is to work and accelerate enhance the rate of genetic for chickpea improvement. How we can do it? We for doing this, we need genomic resources, we need precise phenotyping. In the end, we need breeding sub breeders friendly as a support tool because once you have genomic resource you know, in data, you need these tools to make a wise decision. If you don't have those decision tools wisely, you may end up making wrong decisions and this will mess up everything. Using these three technology, we started deployment of modern breeding approaches. And what are the modern approaches we are using? We are using markets to macro thing, genomic selection, and other things and contributing to increase the genetic gains. Like we were discussing when we started this thing that chickpea, if you see 10 years back, chickpea was a crop which did not have many genomic resources. We have only a couple of hundred SR, not many SNPs, those things were not available at all. Scenario changed at when in 2013, chickpea genome became available. At Ikisa, Dr. Ajiv Vaishnet, together with the Global Consortium, International Chickpea Consortium, we sequenced the chickpea draft genome in 2013 and we changed the direction of chickpeas improvement, chickpea genomic research. If you see, although we sequence one genome, but is it enough? Maybe not. If you see the, when gene bank has a lot of diversity, so if to capture entire diversity, we have one sequencing will not be enough. When we talk about a chickpea at Eclipse, we have more than 20,000 extensions. And then different kind of uh, collections are there, like composite collection of 3,000, core collection of 900, equivalent reference of 300, there's a wild species extension, breeding line, a lot of things are available. So do you think this sequencing one genome will be enough? No. So we need to start. And then we started sequencing of different germ plus lines. We initiated with sequencing of parental lines. These are the, we sequenced 35 parental lines, which are the parents of different mapping population we were using for trait mapping. 
And based on those certified parental lines, we developed about more than about 200 gigabyte data for 35 genotypes, which was an average 10x coverage. And it identified more than 2 million SNPs and about 292,000 indels. And these, if you see the, the line specific in insertion and deletion SNPs were identified. And these SNPs can now be deployed for the, when we're talking about these parental lines for the making cross, making the line improvement. So this resource is helpful for the bidding point of view. Another effort we did that we sequenced more than 100 chickpea varieties. This was released in India and globally. Idea was whether there was one of the challenges every time comes that people talk about oh, there is a lot of diversity and diversity. So we wanted to check when we identified that recent bidding programs enhance the genetic diversity in Desi and Kabuli. We identified 1.3 million SNPs across those 129 varieties and we did a lot of analysis about those how it has evolved, how we have been working those things. And recently, last year, we completed sequencing of more than 400 chickpea lines. The paper came in Nature Native last year, and where we sequenced 300 lines from chickpea reference site, including 100 varieties and other lines, we identified about 4.9 million SNPs. We identified about more than 100 candidate domestic regions, which were affected during the domestication of chickpea. They were affected when chickpea was evolving. And we had some of the three penalty based three penalties in diversity from wild to lenses to the breeding line. So this is some of the analysis which we did based on the resequence data last year. Then based on this thing, one of us sometime in 2014, 15, we initiated a large initiative. People have heard about the 3000 rice initiative. So we also initiated in the chickpea, 3000 chickpea genome initiative, where we sequenced more than 3,366 samples. Total about 30 terabyte data was generated and 4 million SNPs identified. One thing which was new, which was not part of the RICE, together with genetic sequencing data of those 3,000 lines, we, together with national system in India, like IAPR, Junagarh, J Agricultural University, RK, RK College Sihor, and several other institutes, we and uh, Jaipur, at six locations, we phenotyped these 3,000 lines, which was a difficult task. When we start think it was a challenge, and everybody's question is not possible. We took it as a challenge, and we phenotyped all these 3,000 lines at six locations in India for two seasons. And we recorded data on these traits, like agronomy, yield rate data. In addition, we generated some data on the nutrition traits also. There are some of the snapshots from the field because every time the people think, no, it's not possible. It was difficult, it was challenging, but we were able to manage. And this was one thing which gives a very good data and where we stand ourselves that, okay, yes, we are doing something, really something different than others were doing in addition to sequencing. Apart from these things, we had like, I showed different kind of arrays, so we did a lot of Trait mapping, horizontal trait mapping, where we map different traits, droughts, salinity, seed size, health curve per response. Some of these were published, some of these are in the reviews. And these steps, now we are at a stage of there, we got the marker, and now next step is the validation and then deployment in the breeding program. Apart from the salinity, seed size, and all those things, as I mentioned, one of the major focus was nutrition in chickpeas. Although it's high rich, but we there is a lot of diversity all in chickpeas, so we have possibility to increase that nutrition further in chickpeas. So we started with the jiva, and we were able to map some of the traits like beta carotene, iron, phytic acid, beta, vitamins, zinc, and we identified some of the candidate genes for those things, which we started to use for further validation. I told so far about the genomics effort we were doing. In addition, one of the Thing I mentioned the precise phenotyping. So we at Equiset, together with physiologist Dr. Yana Kolava, we and chickpea breeding team Dr. Puram Gore and Dr. Shinivasan, we work on together with them and start evaluating. We mainly use four different platforms: LegiScan, Renault Shelter, Glasshouse, and field-based phenotyping. LegiScan is mainly used for fine scanning of canopy development and architecture characteristics of plants at the vegetative state to understand the physiological aspects. And then we use the rainout shelter for assessment of the plant water use over the entire crop cycle together with relevant agronomic data. 
glass house we use for the control condition where we have to give the stress or estimation of plant water use under control condition in combination with agronomic and yield data. Field based evaluation method is used for the agronomic and yield assessment of the progeny performance. As I mentioned, profile so we took one small project on the integration lines that was developed together with the hardware and the thing. We screened them on the legis scan. We phenotyped them like project leaf area, tree leaf area, specific leaf area, some of those states. And we entered chickpea dot tolerance lines and these things we screened for canopy traits. Some of those lines were we screened the glass holes for dot tolerance and physical parameters. The picture is Rutvik, he's a student of Dr. Rajiv. He's a PhD student, he does a lot of work on those evaluation and take care of those experiments. Based on these things, last year, Dr. Bhardwaj made a release of first ever molecular biology varieties in chickpea in India. Although, if you see among chickpeas, Australia and Canada are one of the developed countries who do a lot of research in chickpea. But India became first country together with Ethiopia where the drought tolerant variety was released last year. It has the name of BGM10216. It gives 12% higher yield compared to the recurrent parent. Dr. Badwa from ICRI, who also gave a talk in Biology platform, he highlighted this thing and this was one of the efforts which paved the way for the new way of research kind of thing. And based on this, if you see several lines are in the pipeline, which will be released this year or the coming year, and this opens the way for the marker straight back to thing of molecular breeding in chickpea and show that what we are doing in the lab, doesn't we only publish and finish it, we take it to make a story. So we believe in starting from basic research, making applied aspect and delivering the product. This is the entire pipeline. Now coming to the area which is of my prime importance these days, optimization of genomic prediction based selection strategy. How we have been doing? If you see that how people say that we should start using markers for the crop improvement, but there is always a challenge how we should use. So if you see almost 12 years back, Rex Bernardo, one of the lead breeder, and I always follow his papers and got an opportunity to meet him once. And I have discussed, so he reviewed this thing long back, 12 years back. We should know why we want to find people, how we, why we want to use them in the selection. How, if you see, there is a clear cut thing. When we are talking about the fuel of size, one or two, we can introduce major QTL, we can do digging dusky, we can make selection of things. So these are the approach, clone QTL compared to the instrument mapping that you can use. But when we are talking number of increasing, we have to combine these QTLs using F2 enrichment, using mass approach. But if we have number of many QTLs, we want to control many QTLs, and we want to make selection using elite lines. So GS is on the approach which is very useful. So ultimately, we need to consider gain per unit time and cost rather than gain per cycle. So use of markers is not straight. Up. We have to see the gain, what gain we are making, how we are contributing those things. So if you see a normal breeding cycle, it starts with the crossing, then inbreeding, seed increase, multi location multi-year testing, and ultimately to field phenotyping, and we contribute to land selection. So entire this is a huge six to eight years process, and it takes for a line development. How we can control it or how it contribute? Sorry. If you see the breeder situation where genetic gain over time is directly proportional to the selection intensity, how many line, lines you select, selection accuracy, how accurately you are selecting the lines, available genetic variance on the parental lines, and inversely proportional to the years per cycle. So how many selection you can make in a year. So if we have to increase the genetic gain and hence the rate of genetic gain, we have to address all those four points. And how we can address those four points? Increase variation. So how ultimately we can increase the variation. So one or two options will be that we start making wide crosses, we start opening mutations. But to make wide crosses, you need to have the those background information on those parental lines. So they, this is where genomic information can be helpful. If a genotype and development database of the parental lines, we can select those parental lines based on the marker information. They are distinctly related and we can start using them in the crossing. 
increase precision how to increase the precision test more plots per line in theory it looks good oh test more plots per line but when we think about the cost testing more lines per plot is not an easy job it comes with a cost and how to address those cost point of thing but if we can include the genomic the genomics not that expensive as the field is not even we can con increase the precision in the line selection select harder test more lines again field print up tripping up more lines is always comes with the cost but genomic selection is always reduce the cost and enable the thing reduce time out of season nurseries how to reduce the times you have to make two three generation a year or you have to take the out of season nurseries how to do for this another many people must have heard of recently the speed bidding approach from dr lee hickey at ek said dr shrinivasan and dr gaur they have also been working on the chickpea so they have developed the rga or speed bidding protocol which can take using this it can take up to 6 to 7 generation per year in that bean house so if you can do such kind of thing this can directly contribute to the increase the rate of genetic gain so this was recently published in the crop journal where they have selected this how they can take up to the 22 days they are the at different stages they select the seed and they were trying to see whether they germinate and ultimately they were able to end that they can six to say seven generation in a year which increase the tremendous seed and even two years of the time you will have your population ready for the field evaluation which earlier used to take six to seven years so this reduce the time of line improvement drastically in addition to this another approach which address all those points is the genomic selection the concept of genomic selection was sometime given in 2001 by mewison the paper was came in the genetics what is genomic selection genomic selection is nothing is a form of marker stress selection that simultaneously estimate all local haplotypes and marker effect across the entire genome to calculate genomic breeding values concept was started for cattle now for last few years we'll start to use the crop improvement but initially it the came what they used to they used to make a reference of training population that they have the lot of phenotyping data available and the thousands of seed data available they estimate the correlation between the phenotyping and this the marker and the prediction equation and then as soon as the new material came they genotype with those markers and using the prediction equation they estimate the gebb they estimate the value of this progeny without waiting for the time so when we are talking the cattle this is the thing but how it helps in the breeding, plant breeding we make crosses we make crossing on the parents suppose our parents are somewhere here and the new population comes so to estimate the value of these things we have to take this progeny to the field but taking the field takes time it takes cost if we genotype those that progeny with these things we can predict the performance so this is how genomic selection helps how it helps maybe i just say nuts and bolts so there are two way approach one is the model training cycle where we have those training population elite lines informative for the model improvement we genotype those lines if they have already been phenotype data available if not we phenotype all these lines and we have genotype and phenotyping data we train those prediction or genomic selection prediction models when the model is established a new germplasm comes we genotype that line we put that line to the genomic selection model we select the lines with based on highest gbvs make crosses and advanced generation is a line development cycle and some of the lines with higher gbv they can that is lead and become part of training population so here we have two set of population training population another is breeding population or we say testing population and here is the line development cycle and is the population improvement cycle which is a two step strip like i just showed how about this breeding scheme in the previous slide this is a simple thing but how we can make it a improvement if we can somehow skip this in breeding seed increase multiplication testing and this if we start after making cross if we start deploying the genomic selection we can reduce this multi year testing multi year location testing to some extent and therefore reduce the selection cycle and time in the thing and they make contribute to the you can like you can screen more number of lines maybe coming here i will show just coming to each point like selection intensity as i mentioned 
genotyping is cheaper than not phenotyping. So instead of taking many lines to the field, we can genotype those larger population in the same cost and this will increase the selection intensity. Selection accuracy, when you got marker linked to the trait, there definitely you can make the off target here so you can select based on precisely. Using those marker base, we can maintain the variable rate leads. It will contribute to maintain genetic variance. And like I mentioned, if you make the selection using this marker base, we can reduce those multi-year testing kind of thing, and we can make selection earlier on the basis line, single prime base, and ultimately contributing to the increase in genetic gain rate. Coming to the chickpea storage genomic selection, so together with Dr. Gore, we defined a set of 320 lines, elite lines as a training population sometime eight years almost now back. We we had some data on those things, but that data was scattered. So we, together with Dr. Bhardo at IRI, we screened these lines at th for three seasons at Equiset and IRI New Delhi for descriptive and yield-related traits under rainfall and irrigation condition. All these lines were phenotyped at three replication and alternatives design at Equiset and IRI. And then we genotyped I'm talking about the 2011 and 12. That time, genome sequence not available. So we were using DART that time. So we got marker data about DART on 3,000 marker data. Later, after genome sequence came, we genotyped these lines with the GenoBS. We got marker about 88,000 markers. And recently, we genotyped this population with the exome, cypher snip arrays, the 50K. And we got about 24K polymorphic markers. And then we started to use these markers using different this summarize of how we have been using the training population. Two locations, three season phenotyping data. We use DART, seq GBS, and everything. Once we have the phenotyping and genotyping data, we are using genomic selection analysis. And how we are using, I'll just explain the next slide. Earlier, when we are using the DART data, we took Dr. Bhar, Dr. Rathod, Abhishek Rathod from Equiset. He is leading the SPDM, Statistical Biometric Data Management Group. We started to work on those data. We use six GS models, the reservation RR bluff model, kinship based regression, then several Bayesian models, and then machine learning based random forest model. And that time we target mainly yield rate, seed yield, 100 seed weight, base to flow coming and base to maturity. And then based on this, we made six those models and we published this thing sometime in 2016. But then we start to think that how we can use, the, because when we talk about the IRI and the potential, there are a lot of G by E. So we start that can we have the G by E infection on those things? Then we start to talk with Dr. Krosa from CIMIT. So then we use this data, two locations, three, the nine environment data, and we added, made some new traits, like average plant diet biomass in addition to the yield, the regular traits. We use new different models which has the main effect to environment and the main effect to the line, L, and the main effect to the DART marker as well as GBS marker. So there are three different interactions of the models. And then we had the six models where we were having the different direction of the L into A environment direction. We use three cross validation schemes, CV1, when a set of lines has not been evaluated in any of the environment. It means randomly we divide lines and we make that no data is available at all for that line. CV2, when some set of lines have been evaluated, some environments, but not on others, can we estimate those things? CV0, an unobserved environment using the remaining environments as training set. So how we were able to do it? And in CV2, prediction performance was very much correlated, the release lines and correlated environment is used, and prediction was very much useful. And this thing was published 2018 in the scientific reports. After publication of these two papers, we thought, okay, it's, we have done a lot of customization on those genomic selection tools. Can we use these tools in the routine breeding program for making selection? Then I also worked with the Gobi, one of the global collaboration. I'll tell about this later. So we, together with Dr. Aya Bhardwaj from IRI, Gobi, and Cornell University, we started to have a practical implement approach where we selected F2 plant from the equisite breeding program, F5 plant from equisite breeding program, as well as IRI breeding program. So in all, we selected 6,000 F5 plants, 3,000 from IRI, 3,000 from equisite. We did genotyping of those 6,000 lines. 
and based on the 320 lines, we select, made a selection and have to compare this method. We made two sets of the lines. One set where the breeder made selection based on the visual performance. Another set was made based on these GBVs. And during the previous year crop season, all these two sets went to the field for a competitive field evaluation. And Dr. Bhargava at IIA, he made wonderful work there. And we were able to find that, yes, it's working very fine. Maybe guys come in the back. So what we did for the analysis we used, we used about total 350.